Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen in North America, Europe, and perhaps even further afield. My name is Catherine Morgan, and I'm a professor in the UCLA Department of Classics, as well as a member of the Faculty Advisory Board of the UCLA Stavros Niarchus Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you virtually to the center for another stimulating weekend episode of lecture and discussion. I want to start by acknowledging and welcoming to our audience, the Consul General of Greece in Los Angeles, Ms. Evgenia Beniakoglu. So it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce to you a longtime friend of UCLA, Professor Josiah Ober, Constantine Mitsotakis Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University, where he's appointed jointly in the departments of classics and political science with an, honor with an honorary appointment in philosophy as well. He received his BA from the University of Minnesota and his PhD from the Department of History at the University of Michigan with a dissertation on Athenian reactions to military pressure and the defense of Attica 404 to 322 BC. He started his teaching career at Montana State University, moved to Princeton University in 1990, and finally, hurrah, made it to California in 2006 to join the faculty at Stanford. Professor Ober bestrides the borders between classics, ancient history, political science, and philosophy, with an enviable command of a range of subjects from Greek epigraphy and oratory to management strategy to self-governing socio-technical systems. I found that one online last night. He has written eight single authored books, not to mention seven more co-authored or edited books and countless articles. I'm just going to list his single authored books, starting in 1985 with Fortress Attica, then moving on to Mass and Elite in Democratic Athens, The Athenian Revolution, Political Dissent in Democratic Athens, Athenian Legacies, Democracy and Knowledge, The Rise and Fall of Classical Greece, and most recently, Demopolis, Democracy Before Liberalism in Theory and Practice. And then there are the three books he's written co or co-written for non-academic audiences, including a company of citizens, what the world's first democracy teaches leaders about building great organizations. This one was also published in Modern Greek by Klidarid Moss in 2003. He's currently working on a co-authored book called The Civic Bargain and on the publication of the Sather lectures that he delivered at UC Berkeley in 2019 entitled The Greeks and the Rational. I shall forego a complete listing of his honors, since, as my favorite poet Pindar would say, the sand on the seashore escapes our count. But I will mention just a few that may be of interest to our group today. His honorary doctorate in economics from the University of Volos in 2015. His time at the University of Edinburgh as Levendis Visiting Research Professor in that same year and his presidency of the American Philological Association, now the Society for Classical Studies, in 2009. His book, Mass and Elite in Democratic Athens, won the Goodwin Prize of the American Philological Association, while Democracy and Knowledge won a prose award for the best book in classics and ancient history, and was listed as one of the independent's 10 best books in history for 2009. I've known Professor Ober for many years now, and I'm always heartened by his good sense, his wit, his range, and his optimism. One always gets the feeling when talking with and listening to him that the study of the past is a treasure house of insight that really matters today. That we are part of an ongoing conversation started over two and a half thousand years ago in this year in which we celebrate the bicentennial of the Greek revolution and the war of independence, it will be fascinating to look back to more ancient episodes of Greek revolutions. 
The title of his lecture is Bargain, Revolution, Bargain, an ancient Athenian recipe for democracy. Professor Ober, Ober please feel free to share your screen and begin at your convenience. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, it's a great honor to be allowed to give uh, this lecture um, at the UCLA Hellenic Center. I want to thank the Nearcos Foundation for making all of this possible. Thank you all for coming on board on a Saturday morning or Saturday evening as it may be for uh, those in the UK. I am really pleased to be able to do this. As Catherine has said, I've had a long relationship with UCLA, many friends there. I'm just thrilled with what you're doing um, uh, at the uh, Hellenic Center. And it's just a joy for me to be able to be able to be part of it um, uh, uh, here with you today. And just finally, it's an especial honor to be able to deliver this lecture on the 200th anniversary of Greek independence. That's a very special time. This is a very special year. And to be able to speak of revolution um, uh, in a positive sense uh, is, I think, a particular pleasure. So let, let's proceed. A fundamental political question. How can a community secure the benefits of social cooperation without being ruled by a master. That is, without being ruled by what the Greeks, the ancient Greeks called a tyrant. Democracy is the answer to that question. But if we're going to make this important real for ourselves, we have to ask what really is democracy? How does it work? How indeed do people really cooperate without a boss, without a tyrant, without an autocrat. So cooperation without autocracy, without a boss, is actually fairly easy in small groups, at least so we're told by the anthropologists. That is, foragers, most human beings throughout most of human history until about 9,000 BCE and some people ever since, that is hunting gathering societies, find it quite easy in fact to create basically democratic kinds of systems to share knowledge, to make decisions collectively. But once we get beyond about 150 or 200 people in a community, it becomes hard. It becomes hard because free riding becomes easier. Self-interested individuals find it easier to cheat, getting the benefits of social cooperation for themselves without giving back to the community. This can lead to cascades of defection um, and ultimately to commons tragedies. And so because of the problem of free riding, because of the difficulty to create a common good without authority, autocracy has been historically common. The autocrat is the, as it were, default ruler of um, a complex society. Now, Athenian history, Greek history generally, but especially the history of ancient Athens, offers us the democratic alternative. So in order to understand this, let's start out with thinking about what the Greeks meant by this word, demokratia. It is, of course, as everyone knows, a conjunction of demos, the people, and kratos, power. But we have to ask, in what sense? So demos has at least four primary definitions in ancient Greek, a local definition as a village or a town, a political definition as the citizenry of a polis, of a city-state, an institutional definition that is the assembly of the citizens, and a sociological definition that is the poor or non-elite um, uh, people of the community. Kratos has then two primary definitions that is power over others, domination, and then power to do something that is strength or capacity. So the question then is, in what sense do the Greeks mean these two terms when they coined this word demokratia sometime in the end of the sixth or early fifth century BC. 
So the hostile definition, which was common by the later fifth century BC and has been revived frequently ever since, is that democracy is the unconstrained domination of the many poor over the wealthy few. That is a kind of majoritarian tyranny. So this takes the sociological meaning of demos as poor, and then the sense of kratos as power over um, or domination. So this hostile definition is very prominent in Greek literature, mostly written by and for elites. But it was not the original definition of the term by the inventors of this system, democracy, nor is it the definition that is used by later Greek Democrats, nor I would say, is it the definition we should be using today. The original meaning, and the one I think that is viable for us today, takes the political sense of demos, that is the citizenry of a state, a polis, um, and kratos as power to do things, that is as the strength of the demos, the capacity of the demos. So in this, if I'm right about this, demokratia, Democracy means the people's capacity to do things, to do public things, the collective self-governance by the citizens. So that answers the question, what is democracy, at least for the Greeks, and I think it should be for us too. But the question we then need to ask is, how does this work? Where does democracy come from? And how can it be sustained over time? How can the citizens collectively govern themselves? My, my answer then is bargain, then revolution, then bargain. So we start with the first bargain. And this is, uh, we're jumping into Greek history, into Athenian history at the early part of the sixth century um, BCE. There's a lot of previous history, but we have to get all through this in a short amount of time. So in 594 BCE, Solon of Athens, already known as a lyric poet, later considered one of the seven sages, the seven wisest men of archaic uh, Greek society, the traditional founding father of Athenian democracy, much later imagined as that, um, about whom there was a long Greek tradition, um, especially Aristotle in his work, The Constitution of Athens or The Constitutional History of Athens and Plutarch um, in his, uh, one of his parallel lives who offers us a, a life of Solon. We're gonna be focusing on Solon, the arbitrator and legislator. So background to what's did, in 594 BCE was a social crisis. There is a struggle between opposing interests. Aristotle and Plutarch tell us that these are basically the masses versus the elites. And they're struggling over a series of resources, over land, debt, labor, and offices. The elite basically want the status quo. They want to keep what they've got. They've got most of it. They'd like to keep all of it. Um, the masses are unhappy. Um, uh, they want a redistribution of the land. They want debt, crippling debt to be canceled. They don't want to be enslaved when they are indebted. They want to be freed from slavery and they'd like a share um, in some of the public offices. So we have to think about then kind of an outline of Solon's problems and what he accomplished. The beginning is this social crisis, the poor being enslaved for debt and the polarization of the elite versus mass, these two sides um, uh, threatening each other, um, angry with each other, willing to use violence, um, a risk then of social collapse, an end of Athens as a viable state. But Solon was accepted as an arbitrator by the elite and the mass, and he came up with a workable bargain. The bargain was involved debt relief, freeing 
individuals who had been enslaved for debt. He forbade the enslavement of Athenians by Athenians, therefore favoring um, the mass, but he refused to divide the land, favoring the elite. Um, and he created a judicial procedure that made elite office holders accountable, favoring the masses, but he links office holding to wealth status, which favors the elite. The question then we can ask is why do the elite and mass agree to bargain instead of fight? Solon has no power. He is the archon, he is the accepted as arbitrator, but he has no, he doesn't have any army behind him. Um, it's got to be a negotiated agreement. Well, both sides agree because they're both feeling pressure. There's actually a violence threat on either side. The elite can bring in mercenaries, the mass have a lot of people. Each side recognizes that there is a social surplus. If they can agree to a deal, they could share that social surplus and each of them are gonna be worse off if they don't figure out a way to share it. They fear an external threat. The neighboring state of Megara is actually um, threatening to take over borderlands and the island of Salamis. They fear the possibility of a tyrant. There could be um, somebody uh, arising who will simply take power. Um, and finally, Solon has a certain credibility. He has a reputation for patriotism. He's a man of the middle who rejects tyranny. So Solon comes up with a bargaining solution. And I'm gonna suggest that this is what Solon was thinking about. Um, uh, this is the way that he thinks through his solution. So he thinks that you've got to basically have a non-zero sum game that each side, the elite and the masses, are going to share a social surplus rather than having a winner and a loser. This is not a zero sum game, or it can't be because it's not gonna be a negotiated bargain if it's zero sum. So we can imagine then the elite share of whatever deal we're gonna cut is on this Y axis here. Um, uh, and then the mass share is here. The elite get more if they go further north, the uh, mass get more if they go further east as it were. So uh, the key point here is that neither side will accept less than it currently has. So this is what people who do bargaining theory call the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, the BATNA, the backstop. And it's at point P. So we see the mass share here already, the elite share here. Um, they're not gonna go down below that. Neither of them is gonna accept anything that is, that is less than that. And that's, everybody knows that. The curve V here represents the full social value of the bargain. If you do everything as well as you can, you cooperate as well as you know, you're capable of cooperating as a society, that's what you get. Um, you get considerably more than you've got um, currently at point P. Um, so that's the Pareto frontier, in, once again, in, in the sort of social theory. Um, and this curve then represents the best outcomes that are possibly available. Um, so where are we gonna be on that curve? Well, the solution space for Solon is somewhere between M prime and E prime here. Why is that? Because the elite will not accept anything down here. Um, uh, and the mass are not gonna accept anything over here because they'd have less than they have currently. Um, so that's Solon's solution space. And the question is, where is he going to set the bargain? How is he going to divide things based on um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the best deal that can, be, that can be got? We're assuming that Solon's hoping to get the best bargain that can possibly be arrived at. So we've got to take into account bargaining strength. Um, uh, that is, what who has the better position, who is more patient, who can wait out the other side, um, who has better threats, who has a better chance of bluffing if it comes to that. Um, and uh, the bargaining strength of the mass 
against the bargaining strength of the elite is going to um, yield a slope intercept like this. Um, you just figure out who's more powerful. Um, uh, and in this case, we're assuming that the um, uh, elite are rather um, uh, more powerful than the mass. Um, if it was absolutely even, it would be right here in the middle. Um, uh, and uh, the, the uh, slope intercept is going to go through point P, where our starting position is. Um, and then in the end, uh, we're going to come up to a point Q. That is going to be the equilibrium solution. That's the best deal. Um, everything that we know, where is the current, you know, where are both sides currently? Um, what's the bargaining strength? Uh, what's the best uh, possible deal that could be got? That is going to be, and that is, that's Solon's solution. Uh, now, of course, we don't have a, a graph like this uh, uh, for, uh, from antiquity, but I think this really, I'm going to argue to you, this really is his thinking. Um, uh, notice that this is a win-win bargain. This is not zero sum. So the elite win, um, they get rather uh, higher share, you can see. Um, the mass win as well. They get more than they had. A, um, they move beyond their uh, uh, the point P, um, but it's not a uh, it's not an equal deal. Um, some get more than the others. The elites have done better than the masses um, uh, in this in this bargain. Uh, so uh, the elites have done better than the masses because um, there's been no um, redistribution of the land. Um, uh, uh, it's a status quo. Um, uh, the masses are getting something, but the thing that they really wanted, you know. What would like to have equal everything? They're not. They're not going to get the Nash solution. Um, I'm calling this a Nash solution to the bargaining problem because what I've done here is suggested that Solon has anticipated um, the key breakthrough that John Nash um, got the Nobel Prize for um, some years ago. Uh, this is one of the big results of modern uh, social theory. Um, and I think that intuitively, Solon saw the basic features of the Nash solution. Um, and this was the nature of his success. Now, here's a worry. And you might say, this just doesn't make sense because actually there's a tractability issue. Solon had to figure out the best alternative to negotiated agreement of each party, that is this point P, based on an aggregate of multiple BATNA points, right? Um, uh, so, you know, we have all these different things going on simultaneously. Isn't this just impossibly complicated and no possibility of actually having a meaningful bargain, uh, a bargaining solution? Actually, no. If we go to the people who study the way bargains go. Um, uh, this is one of the standard textbooks um, for game theory, Dixit and Scaife. Often the enlargement of the set of issues actually makes it easier to arrive at a mutually satisfactory agreement. Because when two or more issues are on the bargaining table at the same time and the two parties are willing to trade off one, more of one against less of the other at different rates, then a mutually beneficial deal exists. And that's exactly what we have going on um, in Solon's world. That is, they're trading off more of one against the other. I've underlined uh, these things that are going to be absolutely, we're going to fight if we don't get that. Um, so if there's redistribution of land, the elite are going to fight. Um, uh, if there's no, no debt relief, the mass are going to fight. And they're ultimately willing to trade off things they care more about for things that they um, recognize that they, they simply aren't going to get everything. How about justice? Um, is this a just solution? Well, Brian Barry, in a very important book, Theories of Justice, that uh, discusses bargaining solutions, Barry suggests that having reckoned as well as possible the strength of each party's preferences over outcome, effective arbitrators do not simply announce the award as a bargaining solution, rather they come up with some formula for relating the award, the distribution of goods, to some principle. So Solon's principle is justice. That is, he can claim it was the right distribution of the various things that were on the table. His formula is equity. It's fairness based on what everybody actually deserves. 
and he distributed them according to desert, which is just, despite, he says, the avarice on both sides. And the fragments of his poetry are very clear on this. Both sides were too greedy, but I came up with a just solution. Was it an ideally just solution? Was this perfect justice? No, it wasn't. Uh, and the tradition acknowledges this. When Solon was afterwards asked if he had enacted the best laws for the Athenians, he replied, the best they would receive. So by implication, there are better, more just laws, but the refusal on both sides to receive less than they could gain by fighting con constrains Solon's feasible set of distributive options. He can't come up with a perfectly just um, agreement because neither side was going to give in enough to create perfect justice. Furthermore, his solution, according to the tradition, was explicitly based on instrumental reasoning, not appealing to perfect justice. So once again, your Plutarch says, when Solon was compiling his laws, Anacarsis, one of the other seven sages, on hearing what Solon was about, laughed at him for thinking he would check the injustice and greed of the citizens by written laws, which were just like spider's webs. They would hold the weak and the vulnerable who might be caught in their meshes, but would be torn to pieces by the rich and powerful. To this, Solon answered that men keep their agreements when with each other when for neither party is their profit in breaking them. And he was adapting his laws to the citizens in such a manner as to make it clear to all that the practice of justice was preferable, that is more profitable than the transgression of the laws. So this isn't appealing to perfect justice. This is appealing to advantage um, uh, and explicit instrumental reasoning. So Solon is not a philosopher ruler. He isn't Plato's dream of Socrates as ruling um, a beautiful city. Rather, he adapts his laws to the citizens in such a manner as to make it clear that the practice of justice was preferable, more profitable than the transgression of the laws. But as Plato saw, to be effective, laws require a ruler, a ruler who is capable of devising innovative new statutes, new legislation, and applying the law to particular cases. So Solon's not the ruler, how could the people, the demos of Athens, be a capable ruler? That's the question we have to ask. This gets us to the revolution, the second step. Um, the background to the revolutionary era at the end of the sixth century BCE, um, there is a execution of a sub-tyrant, Hipparchos, celebrated on this uh, uh, vase painting in 514 BCE. This leads in the you know, long run to the Spartans a few years later, the Spartans invading, deposing the top tyrant, um, uh, a guy named uh, uh, Hippias, uh, at which point the Spartans move out. An individual, an, an aristocrat named Isagoras was chosen archon his rival aristocrat Cleisthenes struggles against Isagoras for power. Cleisthenes does something really dramatic. He brings the demos into his coalition. Isagoras then calls the Spartans back in again to get rid of Cleisthenes. Cleisthenes and 700 families associated with him are expelled, they flee. Um, uh, the Spartans and Isagoras then try to dissolve the Council of Athens, the Citizen Council, but the rest of the Athenians besiege them on the Acropolis. Cleisthenes is recalled. All of this told in dramatic detail by Herodotus. And this then is the origin of democracy. This is the Kratos of the Demos being exemplified in the refusal to accept 
tyranny, a refusal to accept Isagoras with the backing of the Spartans to eliminate the citizen council, um, uh, Cleisthenes, who had promised to create some kind of a new form of order if he were supported, is then recalled to Athens um, and he then enacts reforms. So the revolution of 508 BCE and Cleisthenes reforms can I suggest be modeled as a kind of game. This is not just happenstance. We can actually think about three rational self-interested agents, each seeking to maximize its own advantage. Cleisthenes, we're gonna say with his elite coalition is one player. Isagoras plus his elite coalition and Spartan allies is another player, and the demos of Athens is going to be the third player in our little game here. The expectations of each agent are conditioned on the expected behavior on of the expected behavior of the other agents and on their estimation of probabilities, what's, what's more likely uh, to come out. So a point I'm trying to make here is that the Athenian revolution is not just a happenstance. Um, we can actually think about it as playing out um, interests um, and rational judgment. Oh, here's the game. I'm not going to go through it in great detail. It would take a little, little while. Um, but you can see we have three players, Cleisthenes, Isagoras, and the Demos, um, and that uh, uh, these players are going to have to make decisions. So at the beginning of the game, um, Cleisthenes decides whether he should just fight Isagoras on his own um, uh, or should um, uh, invite in the Demos. Um, uh, these um, payoffs here basically are uh, indicating what happens if you choose different ways. Um, uh, and there's going to be a, a probability here. If he fights, he might win, he might lose. Um, the probability of winning um, at this point for Cleisthenes, if he doesn't have the demos, is very slight. And so his payoff is, um, is, uh, is assumed to be bad. So he invites in the demos because he thinks he has a better shot fighting with the demos than against the demos. Then the demos is going to have to decide, should we accept the offer or reject it? Um, are we going to join the coalition or not? They're going to decide to accept because the alternative is to be dominated by Isagoras and the, and the Spartans. Um, then Isagoras and the Spartans are going to have to say, well, should we just give up um, and say, OK, we can you demos can run things. Cleisthenes can be the boss. No way. Um, uh, they're going to uh, uh, it'd be a very bad payoff for them to do that. So they choose to push um, uh, or Isagoras brings in the Spartans, gets rid of uh, uh, Cleisthenes. Then once again, when the Spartans have arrived, the demos have to say, well, do we just give up? Hey, they're Spartans. Um, or do we fight? Well, if we give up, we get a bad outcome, might be worth fighting. Um, uh, then there's going to be, gee, I wonder what'll happen. This is sort of the nature node. That's just a probability of whether they'll win or lose. And then finally, Cleisthenes, um, uh, when the, uh, uh, the victory is won, is going to have to decide, does he um, uh, democratize or does he uh, renege? Um, uh, and then in the end, is it going to be successful or not successful? Once again, we could work this out in a lot of detail. I could spend the rest of the hour um, playing with this, and we could think about how the various probabilities um, might have been estimated. But the key point here um, is that if we analyze this game, we can think of it in terms of a couple of wagers. So Cleisthenes' wager is that if he offers reforms, the demos will support him against Isagoras and the Spartans, and he wins the wager. The demos rationally accepts his offer, does support him throughout this revolutionary period, and as it turns out, um, uh, they win. That Demos is going to make a wager too that Cleisthenes actually has a plan, um, a workable plan, and that he will carry it out after, if and after the Isagoras and the Spartans have been defeated, that he will not try to um, uh, impose to make himself tyrant. He won't um, uh, bring in his elite buddies and uh, create an oligarchy. And the Demos wins its wager. Cleisthenes does have a clever plan for reorganizing the various background institutions um, uh, in a way that empowered the demos. He does follow through his promise to implement the plan. 
This is all done in the background of a third party threat, that is the credible threat of Isagoras and the Spartans to take over Athens, ensures that the incentives of Cleisthenes and the Demos remain aligned. So we're assuming they're both self-interested. Cleisthenes might like to rule as a tyrant. The Demos might like to uh, uh, not have uh, uh, anybody running anything, um, but they stay together. So Cleisthenes and the Demos make a bargain and they keep to it. So the revolution, this uprising, um, uh, yields ultimately this bargain, this, this decision to democratize, um, that Cleisthenes will stick with the uh, uh, demos, they'll uh, create new institutions, and um, they'll become a powerful state. They'll uh, uh, beat their, their enemies, which is exactly what does happen. So if we then think forward, Athens, after the revolution for the rest of the, you know, so sort of fully democratic period, my hypothesis is that Cleisthenes reforms, these reforms that were rationally put into place because in a sense, he didn't have a better play. He couldn't make himself a tyrant. The reforms provide a framework for the development of a state that is capable of sustaining basic security and welfare along with much else, great culture and so on. The elites, fail to capture the state because the citizen masses remain capable of collective action. So I'm assuming that the elites would just as soon run things for their own interests, but they are not able to do that. Continuous experimentation drives constant innovation. That is Athens adapts to changing conditions. And all of this is facilitated by formal institutions and emergent political cultural norms. So the upshot is the demos does rule as a capable agent. So that's, the, that's the, the hypothesis. And we don't have time to work it out in detail, but if you think about the constitutional reforms that create the famous Athenian democracy, the tribe reforms um, that Cleisthenes uh, institutes, um, uh, the, uh, ch uh, the changes that create the boule, the citizen council of 500, um, uh, the uh, reforms that create um, the legal structure of the law courts um, of Athens. All of these, I would argue, can be understood as the manifestation of basically rational preferences and rational beliefs on the part of the relevant players. So let's jump to the opinion of a local observer. This is the so-called old oligarch, an anonymous text written sometime in the later part of the fifth century BC. The old oligarch isn't a fan of democracy. Um, he's basically writing to tell his fellow aristocrats, non-Athenian aristocrats, how it is that things work here at Athens. He agrees, you think this is crazy. Um, this you think this is bad, and I'm going to tell you, of course, it's bad because you know, who likes the idea that many ordinary people are running the affairs instead of us elite guys, but it's not crazy. That's his point. It's not crazy. Um, uh, so the point of the essay is how well Athens, many ordinary citizens manage their affairs in their own self-interest. That's what he wants to say. This is all self-interested. Ordinary Athenians' preferences, he points out, include not being enslaved, which the old oligarch says, let's face it, we'll, we'll enslave them if we take over. And their interests include living well from the distribution of offices by dessert instead of by family privilege. Um, he says, well, yeah, that they do in fact prefer it that way. Um, uh, his point is that the Athenian masses get what they prefer. They have rationally aligned preferences. They get what they prefer. Um, uh, and in the background, um, this works out in part because of a persistent internal threat. There is a constant risk of oligarchy, that is enslavement. See the book by Matthew Simonton, for example. And in a sense, the Athenians remain, the ordinary Athenians remain aligned in their interests. Um, they remain uh, aware of the need to do this because they recognize there is a persistent threat. So we had a persistent threat, external threat uh, in the time of uh, Solon, a persistent internal threat. Democracy actually does well in the face of persistent threats. <laughs> 
So we can think about um, uh, beliefs, choices, and actions. The old oligarch shows that mass preferences were unified by their recognition of the risk of a bad outcome to themselves. If the elite take over, the many will be enslaved. Moreover, um, the old oligarch shows us that the many had beliefs about the world that were coherent enough so that their unified preferences, their preferences not to be enslaved, led to rational choices that they set up the world in a way that ensures that they are not enslaved and pushes them to cooperative collective action. In sum, then, many diverse individuals did succeed in behaving over time as a rational collective agent. But how? Um, and the how is explained through these democratic institutions and cultural norms. So we can think of, for example, the citizen assembly um, here on the Penix um, or the new law courts. Essential to this whole system is that rational beliefs have to be formed in part on the basis of experts. The Athenians have to be willing to listen to experts. As indeed, Plato in his dialogue, the Protagoras, asserts that they were. Socrates speaking here says, when we, we Athenians, are gathered in assembly and the state has to deal with an affair of building, we send for builders as advisors on what is proposed to be built, and so on in all matters that are considered to be learnable and teachable. But if anyone else whom the people does not believe to be an expert attempts to advise them, no matter how handsome or wealthy or well-born, that is how aristocratic he may be, not one of these things induces them to accept him as an advisor, why they laugh and shout him down until either he shuts up or else the marshals pull him down and expel him altogether. That is how they, the Athenians, proceed in matters in which they believe there is relevant expertise. As recent work by, for example, Mirko Cannavaro at the University of Edinburgh has shown the assembly procedure aims at consensus. The Athenians certainly did have different opinions. They have different opinions about policy. They had different opinions about best outcomes. But when they gathered in their great citizen assemblies, Canavero shows they're trying to come up with a consensus decision. They try to work towards a decision that can at least be imagined as the one we all preferred. And he shows that usually they do, um, that deeply divided votes of the assembly are actually um, uh, a very rare. Moreover, as Federica Carugati has shown in a recent book um, on Athenian constitutionalism, Judicial procedure is both designed so as to allow for innovation, but also to press towards accountability. So Karagati shows that after the Peloponnesian War, especially the Athenians redesigned their legal system. They recognized there were flaws in their earlier form of legal accountability. They redesigned it to make it more effective, more fair. Ultimately, how do they do this? Well. Karagati suggests they ask themselves, what would Solon do? This is the period in which Solon becomes imagined as really our founder, um, the guy who really set up the initial bargain that made it possible for us to all have this thing together. Karagati suggests that elites and masses could agree on this idea of Solon and they could come up with some idea of what would Solon do. Furthermore, there are rational incentives of elites to cooperate um, uh, with democratic norms as various work by, for instance, Sarah Forsdyke, David T. Garten, Mark Domingo Gagex has shown the elites are in various ways incentivized both through honors and in threats um, by the actions of the collectivity to stay engaged, um, to stay involved to contribute to the democracy, to pay their taxes, um, to provide effective leadership, to not try to um, uh, take over the government for their own purpose. 
Once again, this is noticed by our friend, the old oligarch, um, uh, who says, I pardon the people themselves for their democracy. One must forgive everyone for looking after his own interests. Once again, rationality. But whoever is not of the people and yet chooses to participate in a democracy rather than in an oligarchy has prepared himself for the resources for doing wrong. He has realized that it's easier for an evil man to escape notice in a democratic state than in an oligarchic one. And here I think the old oligarch just misses his own basic point. His point is always about self-interest. And he just doesn't see, or he refuses to see, that the cost-benefit equation, the incentives that are designed in this system, make it rational for self-interested Greek elites to cooperate with democracy. It gives them a better payoff to stick with the system than to try to overthrow it. They're better off inside the bargain than outside the bargain. So conclusion, democratic capability and rationality, Athens then was a rational state in the sense of having a collective ruler that is the people, the demos of Athens, that has rank ordered baseline preferences, prefer not to be enslaved than to be enslaved, prefer to be relatively prosperous than to be impoverished, prefer security to non-security. They have coherent beliefs about risk and other agents' preferences. They're able to think about risk of, you know, we're not, it's not a sure thing that we're gonna win fighting with Cleisthenes, but it's a risk worth taking. They have the capacity to make choices and act on preferences and beliefs so as to gain their most desired available outcome. Recognize that some outcomes aren't possible. We're not gonna get land distribution under Solon, um, but we're gonna get the best available outcome. We're gonna get the best bargain we can get. And they develop and sustain institutions and norms that promote cooperation across social groups so that neither side is simply going to war with the other side. Um, rather, um, everybody stays in the game because they're doing better off in the game than they would have done outside the game. Upshot then is a high capacity, rational democratic state. And the question for us, I would say, is how can we in our modern democratic states with all the troubles and difficulties that we face these days, how can we do as well at greater scale under the complex conditions of modernity? Well, I wish I had a neat answer to you, but at least here's a place to start. Um, uh, we might ask ourselves, what would Solon do? Not in the sense of what would a wise man in the early sixth century BC do, but how can the best possible bargain be struck between the various parties um, that we have how can we figure out a way to cooperate with one another so it's a positive sum outcome so we can get away from zero sum struggles. Solon, I think at least offers us a model of that kind of thinking. And I would suggest that this is one reason that we should continue to study the ancient Greek world. Even if you don't love it as much as I do, and I suppose many of you do, there are things we can learn here. There are things we need to learn. Um, uh, the Greeks still have a great deal to teach us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Josh, for a really fascinating, a really illuminating revision of the Salonic bargain and the Cleisthenic revolution, uh, giving us right a whirlwind tour through rational choice and game theory and making us think about successful democracy as a process of rational choice uh i think we can now open the floor to questions and there is uh already there is already a question in the chat i'm going to read it uh out to you from from right do you agree that a, mo that a modern democracy at our millennium 
needs reliable real-time referendums with the possibility of new entries, comments, solutions, ideas by the folk that are the public uh, and, uh, and as well as the solutions and ideas of the politicians. Each time through a specific reliable internet platform uh, so that there are wise decisions by the government which will reflect the people up to a point for the creation of a system where everyone will feel special. This is a really, uh, this is a great question um, and I think an important one. Um, uh, so we can all think of examples of really bad referendum outcomes or at least um, the, uh, outcomes that probably uh, we wouldn't have uh, 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 thought were, were the wisest possible. Um, uh, and so some people have argued that any referendum, any kind of uh, turning over um, uh, decision authority to anything other than um, a group of uh, uh, well-informed uh, uh, expert uh, representatives is simply madness. I don't think that's true, but I think that in order for referendums to work, we have to have an educated demos. We actually have people have to have practiced this. We can't just have a referendum once every generation um, and expect it to go well. People actually have to understand what it is to come together and make a collective decision. So think about Canavero's work um, about driving towards consensus. The referendum tends to drive towards 51%. Um, uh, and all of the incentives are to simply get just over half uh, and to do whatever it is necessary to do that. Um, and then you end up uh, with a kind of unhappiness that referendums often yield. So I think in order for referendum politics to work, we have to think about how to, how to, how to, how to have actually citizens who understand what you're doing um, if you come together in a kind of whatever we imagine, an internet forum and so on. So we need education first. Um, uh, and I think that is probably the key thing. Um, uh, education, both in schools and universities, but also practice. We need to practice this at smaller scales um, before we're ready to do it um, regularly at the large scale. Okay, Martha Payne asks, do you make anything of the fact that both the development of democracy in Athens and the development of the Republic in Rome took place about the same time, or is it just a coincidence? Yeah, thank you, Marty, I, uh, an old friend. Uh, I, it's, it's one of these puzzles. Uh, now, of course, the Romans were very keen um, to tweak their uh, chronology to uh, make it exactly the same uh, year, but, in any event, we certainly something important does happen um, in Rome at just about the same time that the uh, democratic revolution that happens in Athens. Um, I, and uh, I, I think that broadly speaking, we can understand that different city states, and Rome is a city state at this point, it's not a particularly big city state in the uh, uh, end of the sixth century um, uh, BCE. Uh, different city states in an ecology in which there was the people, the people in these city states were aware of what was going on elsewhere, are experimenting with various kinds of citizen action. Now, it's different in different city states. To what extent the Romans were inspired by what things are going on in the Greek world, they certainly are aware of the Greek world at this point. Um, uh, and uh, so I think it's um, probably not a pure coincidence, I think, but it's not a matter of um, uh, simply imitation um, uh, by one of the other. I think there's a background, um, uh, a world of city-states um, that are struggling to come up with answers to that basic question, how can we cooperate socially without being ruled by at least a single boss, a tyrant? So uh, Paul Scotton has made a comment and it connects with a question that I wanted to ask. So I was sort of I'll put in my question and then his comment. So my, my question to you is, you've talked a lot about what constrains the elites, right? self-interest, right? What though uh, constrains the demos? What makes the demos act 
rationally. One always thinks of the trial of the Argonusi generals where they were reported to have said, it would be terrible if we could not do what we wanted. Yeah. And Paul's comment is, our problem seems to be that rationality is no longer the basis or goal of our democracy. This is troubling. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree that there is a sense in which um, uh, uh, the kind of rationality I'm driving for um, uh, appears to be less you know, dominant uh, in uh, our collective soul, using Plato's kind of language. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I think this is in part because we have been tricked into imagining the world as one in which every outcome, uh, yeah, every kind of bargaining outcome, if you will, is a zero sum game. So everything they win, I lose. Everything I win, they lose. And this is just explicit in a lot of the uh, language that is out there in, in politics these days. Um, uh, so um, I think as soon as we think of politics is a zero sum game, we give up on the kind of rationality I'm talking about, driving towards a positive sum outcome, these win-win outcomes. It may be unjust in that one side wins more than the other, but they are beneficial in that both sides do better than they can get outside of the bargain. So I think we're, that's something you have to both recognize, so that's part of the education story. But it's also, I think, that in a sense, we have forgotten the threat of not making those win-win bargains. We've forgotten to be as afraid as we should be of the breakdown of public order, of uh, the costs of fighting, because the alternative to bargaining is always fighting. Um, and I don't mean just squabbling, I mean killing each other. Um, that's the fear that the Athenians faced. Um, uh, and not, you know, in a sense, kidding ourselves that we can keep on trying to drive towards zero sum, you know, outcomes without falling into really bad kind of violence. Um, uh, is, uh, it, it's not really on the table. Um, it's not on the table without a boss without an autocrat to keep the peace. So I think we need to rethink the whole, as it were, game of politics in a way that does return to the kind of rationality I'm concerned with. Um, that is, um, being inside the bargain is going to be better for everybody. Um, uh, and the downside of not making a bargain is actually really very, very, very serious, very costly. Um, how we bring that to people's attention, I think once again, this is a matter of, you know, ultimately education. So Chris and Michelle O'Gorman uh, say, thank you for an excellent lecture. And then comment in your chart of the overview of both parties positions that Solon was facing, neither side had an underlined position that is ready to fight mm -hmm. in the same area. Would Solon have been successful had this not been the case? In other words, what happens when each party has an incompatible red line? Yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a great question. Um, uh, and at that point, um, uh, if you say that my, the, the standard I set is you know here and falling below that standard um, uh, uh, will trigger fighting um, and you can't achieve that standard for both sides, yeah, then you'll have a fight. Um, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, um, I think the point that we have to keep in mind is that people need to recognize the cost of fighting um, and the costs are higher than people I think tend to imagine who haven't been in the kind of world that the Greeks lived in, um, in which fighting was always possible. And fighting always meant some people are killed. And that nobody is in the position of, well, it's not gonna be me, I'm outside the fight. Fighting always means you and yours could be killed. 
or expelled um, or have your property um, uh, uh, expropriated. Um, you could really lose badly if the bargain isn't cut. So those red line deals, um, you have to be pretty sure um, uh, that you're gonna win the fight. Um, uh, and that's a probability calculation. If you think you're gonna win the fight, you think you'll do better by fighting, you'll fight. Um, but once again, you have to be willing to bear the costs. Vlad Kolesnikov asks, how fragile or robust was the rationality of democracy? So we're back to rationality again. Would it have survived with Twitter? <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> would it have survived with Twitter? I mean, the, the Athenians have a kind of Twitter, right? Um, but it's a but it's a face-to-face -face Twitter, right? It's the it's the it's the um, uh, uh, chit chat um, in the agora. Um, it's 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 the the, the rumor mill. Um, and the the Athenians were very aware of rumor gossip. Um, in fact, there's a moment in which uh, one of the Athenian speakers in the assembly says that um, uh, uh, rumor of gossip, feme, uh, is, is, is like a god. It goes everywhere. So um, there is a lot of this, but the difference is, is their tweeting is much closer to face to face. If I'm going to be trolling someone, my trolling is out there, at least there are some people who are just who know it's me who's, who's doing it. So uh, I think that's one of the big dangers of our current social media is that we can say um, really violent things without having it come back to who is it that's actually actually saying it. Um, uh, so I think the, the Athenian um, uh, democracy was in, it was in some sense fragile. I mean, we know it, it, it collapses at the end of the fifth century um, BCE, but then they rebuild it quickly um, against, you know, really it would seem, you know, really high odds. Um, uh, and they rebuild it on a somewhat different platform of greater commitment to certain kinds of legality. Um, uh, and it turns out to be then startlingly robust. Um, if we look at the instances of civil violence or civic violence, um, uh, struggles to take over the state, um, one of my PhD students, Scott Arsenas, uh, wrote a dissertation on this. And he shows that Athens, although we have these examples of civic violence um, at the end of the fifth century, was remarkably stable um, by Greek standards. Um, democracy turns out to be, at least a well-designed democracy like that of Athens, turns out to be considerably more stable than most forms of oligarchy. Um, so yeah, there's no such thing as a perfectly stable democracy. There's no such thing as a perfectly stable any form of government. Um, every form of government is liable to be replaced by something else. That's one of the big takeaways of Aristotle's work in the politics. The whole of the fifth book of the Aristotle's politics is all about how do civil strife how does civil wars break out? Um, and um, uh, he says, yeah, there's all kinds of ways they break out. Uh, so the Greeks were really, really aware of the possibility of civil war, of regime change. We in the 21st century or 20th, 21st century sort of ended up convincing ourselves that we're at the end of history. You know, my colleague, Frank Fukuyama, a, a wonderful man, a great scholar, by the way, but came up with this strange idea that um, uh, a liberal democracy was um, the only game in town and would be now forever. This was in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And as it turns out, that's just wrong. Um, history keeps on happening. Um, and I think we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of the idea that we had in the United States, a constitutional bargain back in the 18th century, imperfect, but you know, did a lot of good work for us. We can tweak it a little bit for along the way, um, uh, but basically we're done. Um, hey, we have a bargain, it's fine. Uh, uh, we can just cruise along in this machine and everything is gonna go just fine. That's false. Bargains need to be, as it were, revisited, revised, um, uh, uh, renegotiated. Um, uh, and unless we think about democracy as an ongoing process of 
creating bargains among citizens in which we give and we get, um, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, we can't fall into the idea, the, the, the fantasy um, of um, some kind of a perfect and um, uh, un, uh, uh, you know, uh, unproblematic uh, uh, form of uh, political stability. It doesn't exist. And Twitter, of course, takes us back to problems of uh, problems of scale. But I want to move on to uh, to Charles Nathan's question. He says, uh, many of today's divisions seem to be within the demos, not only between mass and elite, and also based on differences in identity, urban versus rural, local versus global. How would Athens or Solon or you handle divisions of that sort? Yeah. Right. So here we can go to um, uh, the original Cleisthenes uh, solution. So uh, the... Um, in the aftermath of the revolution, Cleisthenes creates, um, uh, uh, basically has the authority, is granted the authority by the demos to come up with a bold solution. And the big issue that I think he saw as being a problem for Athens is that identities were regional, um, that people in different parts of the extended Athenian territory saw their interests as being aligned with people from their village or you know guys like me who make their living um, uh, by trading and fishing on the coast or guys like me um, who uh, have uh, our farms um, in the uh, inland uh, and so on and that the solution that Cleisthenes came up with um, was a kind of mix and match it was a complex system that basically grouped together the Athenians from different parts of Athenian territory, you know, village and neighborhood by village and neighborhood, group them together in these new so-called tribes. They were completely artificial, however. We think of tribe as being, you know, in the deep, misty past, but these are completely artificial groupings and really meant that lots of the ways you lived your life, you lived your religious life, that you um, uh, fought in the army, uh, for example, and that you uh, could be chosen as a representative of your community on the citizen council, put you together with people from different parts of Athenian territory. So you had to deal with them. You learned about them. You actually were um, uh, made to be engaged in these very, you know, important, you know, fighting together in the army and so on in, 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 the, in, these, in these various uh, uh, highly salient um, uh, forms of activity. Uh, and it worked. It basically creates an Athenian identity so that you keep your local identity. Hey, I'm a guy of village X. But to that, you add your tribal identity. I'm a guy of tribe, you know, number one, um, of which village X is just one of the villages. And the tribes together are the demos, us, we. Um, and so you get this scaffolding um, that brings together people with different identities um, uh, into a collectivity without losing their local identity. But it is then you get this, this, this overlay and you actually learn to deal with people who are different from yourself. And you realize that you, know, you have something in common together. We are Athenians. I think that's what we're missing. Um, uh, we're missing that kind of scaffolding that allows us as citizens with our own particular identities, whether we you know, have them because of ethnicity or whether we have them because of gender or sexuality or um, uh, region or wealth or whatever it is, we're not, we don't have the ways to group ourselves together um, uh, in ways that are other than at the full national scale, you know, with the, you know, we the people of the United States. That's what we're missing. Um, uh, and the, Systems that used to do it, a, you know, an army that drafted people made, you know, my father told me stories about how much he learned when he fought in the Second World War because he was thrown in with a bunch of people that were nothing like himself. Um, people he had to, had to learn to, to, to deal with. Um, so we don't have that. Um, uh, the public schools aren't serving that function um, uh, effectively uh, any longer. Um, uh, we're at a point in which 
unless we can think of how to reinvent some forms of intermediate institutions that bring us together, um, uh, uh, people from multiple different forms of identity um, uh, into something that is salient and meaningful and we can actually do things together, I think um, uh, we're gonna continue to be in trouble. That's, that's, that's the big the challenge for us today um, is thinking about in this sense, what would Cleisthenes do um, in terms of how to create some kind of um, way in which we can be together um, without having to be all of us, you know, without having to be the, you know, without having, having to jump to the to the full uh, we the people. Um, that's a big design challenge, but it's not an impossible one. So Alexander Malast asks, what was the role in this political struggle between elites? and demos of the sophists and the demagogues. Ah, that's great. Um, uh, so uh, in the, uh, Catherine mentioned uh, this book I've been working on that was um, based on my, my Sather lectures of a uh, uh, year and a half ago. Um, uh, so a, it's a lot of it is about, about sophists. I've got very interested in the sophists. Unfortunately, we don't know as much about them as we would like. Uh, but I would argue, without going into detail right now, but read my book. <laughs> I hope it'll be out in a year or so. Um, uh, it's a, uh, the, the sophists, I think, are the ones who really thought through a theory of self-interest, um, a theory of instrumental rationality. Um, they bring together a bunch of um, intuitions that are out there in the air, trace it all the way back to Homer. They make a basically a theory of how to be a strategically rational individual, um, how basically to do what we would now call game theory and how to think in those terms. And I think that's ultimately what they were teaching. Or at least that's the foundation of what they're teaching. Um, uh, it was not necessarily vicious. Um, uh, it doesn't mean because you are thinking strategically that you're just figuring out how to hurt other people, um, uh, but it could be put to vicious um, uh, uh, purposes as we know sometimes that it in fact was. Um, but I think the sophists are important in this. They, they are teaching people who become influential. And then ultimately the thinking of the sophists, the sort of way of thinking about ourselves as instrumentally rational as strategic beings, um, uh, it permeates into the culture and becomes part of how the Athenians think of themselves. And I think ultimately this does push towards the kind of rationality I'm talking about. Um, uh, it isn't the only way the Athenians imagine themselves. They know that they make decisions because of emotion, because of other, other as it were, non-rational um, uh, motivations. But in the background, there is this self-consciousness about ourselves as engaging in strategic behavior. And this makes bargaining possible. As soon as you actually think of yourself and others who you're involved with as engaged in a strategic game, um, trying to get the best outcome you can, it actually makes it easier um, to drive towards a solution because you think of your opponents in the game um, as players in a game in which there is an equilibrium solution in which you can do better or worse, um, as opposed to just simply being monsters who are opposing you for vicious enemy kind of reasons. Um, so that rationality to the extent to which it is you know, generated actually can push against the idea of seeing opponents as enemies who have to be eliminated. As soon as we're thinking that way, you know, it's just gonna be fight. So demagogues, you know, are um, at least partly people who are well-trained by sophists. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but we have to keep in mind that this term demagogos um, uh, is something that you accused your opponent of, um, that the demagogues, generally speaking, public speakers who chose to try to influence the assembly in um, meetings of the assembly are an essential part of the whole system. The Athenians needed to have people standing up in front of them saying, 
here's the argument for why we should or should not go to war, why we should or should not, you know, build a new building. Um, and they had to be both skillful speakers as well as expert in whatever they're talking about. Um, so demagogue is a term that could be used pejoratively, somebody who tricks us into things that we shouldn't have done, but it can also be um, a essential structural feature of a working um, democratic system, someone who has learned enough about some aspect of general importance and is capable of putting that into language that we, the people, can understand. That's a good demagogue. That's, that's what we actually need. Um, okay, and I think this may be our last question. This is from um, Constance de Kiwi. Do you think that there is a tipping point in terms of population size where a nation becomes ungovernable in a meaningful fashion, free of corruption? Yeah, that's a, that's a really hard question. Um, now, I guess one way to sort of cheat on the question is to say that free of corruption is too high a bar. Um, uh, to be corruption free is to be like perfectly just. Um, so what I would say is, let's reformulate the question to say, have a manageable level of corruption. So that corruption is not the dominant form of, as it were, I don't assume that when I'm engaging with you as a fellow citizen or a public official, that you're corrupt. I don't come into the office where I'm gonna get my driver's license and say, um, you know, how much uh, to the um, person across the desk. Um, uh, uh, so, um, so, uh, free enough of, of, of corruption, let's say. And I think we don't really know. I, I, I think the answer is, is no. Um, uh, but I think as scale increases, it's an extremely important question, because as scale increases, the problem of design gets harder. And the problem of democratic design gets harder. Um, clearly having, you know, um, you know, a few dozen people sitting around the campfire deciding, you know, should we go north or south? Um, north, you know, there might be more mammoths, you know, south the roots are better or something. Okay, you can imagine arguing that out and we're going to make a decision, we're going to come to a consensus and we'll go one way or the other. Scale up to Athens. Um, we now have um, tens of thousands of citizens. Um, they figured out the design solution to be able to you know, drive towards you know, basic consensus decisions in an assembly that had thousands of people all gathered together. Um, that was hard. Um, it takes really good institutional design. Jump up to um, then uh, the you know, 18th or 19th century um, democratic experiments with representatives um, and with potentially referendum politics as a bat in the background, jump up to um, the hundreds of millions that we have and the level of diversity in that population that we have. In each case, the design problem gets harder, but the background notion, the background question we're trying to solve is the same. Can many people cooperate at scale without a boss? Um, and at each point up to now, let us say, we found some way to do that, or at least some places have done it with manageable levels of corruption. Um, I think we're at a difficult point, whether it's a tipping point or not, but we, I think we're, we are at a point in which we're gonna have to really think seriously about how to redesign some fundamental institutions such that um, uh, we can deal with the societies that we now have at the, at the, at the, at the size and at the level of uh, identity diversity that we have. But it doesn't seem to me it's impossible. Um, uh, and it's worth working on really hard. The alternative of autocracy is, I would argue, not a good one. Um, uh, uh, it has really high costs. Um, uh, the alternative of fighting is really bad. So, you know, I'm going to say, Catherine said I'm an optimistic person. I try to maintain optimism. It's worth being optimistic um, uh, because if we simply give up um, and say, 
you know, autocracy is our only, our only hope. Um, we just hope that the master is good to us. We will have been given up. We will have given up a great deal, and we will have given up. I can say to this audience, a big part of our deep Hellenic heritage. I think that would be a bad thing. Well, I think on that optimistic note, which is also a, a, a call to action, we can draw the formal parts of these proceedings to a close. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Ober just for a fabulous lecture and a really, really engaging question period. Thanks to all of you for being here and we will see you at the next event.